we have now a Professor David Jason as our uh, another speaker. He, David got his, uh, first of all, his work in partial differential equations and harmonic analysis. He graduated from Harvard University at uh, 1975, got his PhD from Princeton in 1980, then the postdoc University of Chicago in 1881, and from 81 on, he has been to MIT. So it seems like he has been to all the reasonably good places. Uh, he is a, a recipient of Sloan Fellowship and a presidential young investigator. He was also invited to the ICM International Congress of Mathematicians as a speaker, was elected to the National Academy of Art and Science. In 2004, he became a McVicar Fellow at MIT, and in 2012 he received, uh, together with John Lee, the Stefan Bergman Prize for AMS, from the AMS, and uh, also became a fellow of the AMS. If I had time, but I don't, I would have told you a lot about Stefan Bergman, because I wrote my master thesis on Bergman's uh, kernel functions. And polyacrylic functions and, uh, and Armstrong kernel uh, functions, and uh, it, it was Armstrong that invited me to the United States. So please welcome uh, David. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Avner. I'm going to turn that off so that it doesn't give us feedback. Uh, I should, I, 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 sorry to, to make it a silly introduction, but you know, my favorite, my father's favorite story about Stefan Bergman was that he said, I speak seven languages, English the best. <laughs> anyway, um, so, anyway, uh, I, I, I also have to say, uh, you know, this is my first time back in uh, Columbus, Ohio since 1974. Uh, I was, uh, so that's 48 years ago, I guess, if the arithmetic serves me well. I was a, a, a camper in the, in the Ross program, math camp, starting in 1970, and then I was a counselor there. So I was, spent several summers here, uh, very happy summers here. I consider it to be very important to my development as a mathematician. And, and, and Arnold Ross was a, 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 a bumbling fool. He, he, he did this on purpose to, to uh, you know, encourage us in mathematics. And he would make mistakes and so on and so forth. I'm going to try to, I, I, won't, I won't impersonate him. That would be impossible. But anyway, he, he also uh, had this motto, which was think deeply about simple things. And at the time, I thought it was just, it's, first of all, he was unbearably old. He was you know, five years younger than I am today. And uh, he was also, uh, uh, you know, this was just incredibly pompous. How could you possibly think deeply about simple things? You know, you have to go back to uh, you know, some, some ancient time before mathematics became so sophisticated. But, but, you know, he was right, and I'm, I'm trying very hard to do this in my, in my uh, you know, in my old age here. So I'm going to try to try to do that. Uh, and I, I think what I'm talking about really is simple on one level, and at the same time it's, it's, it's aesthetically uh, useful. Anyway, let me um, see if we can get started. Okay, so my, my title is The Geometry of Level Sets. These are level sets of solutions to differential equations. And the differential equation that we'll be focused on is, uh, let's see, does this actually work? Maybe not. Apparently not. Maybe it has a, an on switch. It's definitely, oh, maybe it has an on switch.
So what we're talking about is the Laplacian of u. So there's the Laplacian is equal to some function of u. That's called a semilinear elliptic equation. And the question is just how do the level sets, the, 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 the sets where u is constant, which are some surfaces inside of, the, of, of space, how do, how do those behave? That's, that's the question for all three lectures. And uh, I'm going to start with a prologue, which is the uh, sort of canonical example of this, which is uh, elementary and, and, and well known. Uh, but um, because this is supposed to be a fairly general talk, I'm going to be focusing on things which are extremely basic and fundamental and very, very important. So first of all, we're going to simplify things by putting the right-hand side 0, all right? So just harmonic functions, just Laplacian of u is equal to 0. And we're going to assume an extra condition, which is that the directional derivative in the vertical direction is positive. OK? If that's positive, if the, if the gradient is non-zero, then the level surfaces are smooth by the implicit function theorem. So they're all smooth level surfaces. But not only that, because the, the, the directional derivative in the vertical direction is positive, that means it's a graph in the horizontal direction. So what we're talking about are level surfaces which are pretty simple. They're topologically completely trivial. They're just graphs. All right? Now, if in addition we assume that the function is defined for all of space, it's entire, then it turns out that the Harnack inequality implies that actually that directional derivative is just identically constant. OK? So let's just uh, uh, prove that. There's not going to be any proofs until maybe the very end of this lecture. But the Harnack inequality says that if you have a harmonic function which is positive, then its size on a, and it's defined on a ball of radius r, then on half the ball, its max and min are comparable. It can't vary, fluctuate too much on this smaller ball. That's what the Harnack uh, uh, inequality says it's the most important inequality in, in, uh, in elliptic uh, uh, theory. And if you apply it for very large R, then it implies, because you know, you just go from the origin out. The value at the origin controls the value everywhere, because if it's to get to the ball of radius R over 2, you just need to know that it's defined in the ball of radius R, and of course that it's positive there. So it's a really a lot of information, and that causes there to be control by just the origin, the origin control. So the right-hand side here is less than or equal to the minimum at the origin. And so everywhere, because r can go to infinity, this is a bounded function. And the minute it's bounded, it's constant by the Liouville theorem. There are no bounded harmonic functions. So there, there are no positive harmonic functions except for constants. There are no bounded harmonic functions except for constants. That's what the, these two theorems together are telling us. So, so what we're saying is that, uh, again, the conclusion is that the directional derivative uh, in the vertical direction is constant. And that has a, 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 a direct consequence, which maybe I'll, I'll, I'll draw on the blackboard here, which is, which is that the function u is just a constant, that very same constant c times xn plus a function of the other variables. All right? And this means that the graphs are just exactly the same. All right? So this is the simplest case of level sets. I set it on the next slide here. The, the function is constant, the, the, the normal derivative, the vertical derivative is constant, so the function is of the form a constant times xn plus a function of the rest of the variables. And so all of the, the uh, uh, level surfaces, which I'm calling m sub tau, for, for u equals tau, are just translates of each other. It just, just goes straight up. So that means if I know one of them, the other ones have been ordered to be exactly the same. And if I know this top one, then the bottom one. So each one is telling the other one what to do. They're all little dictators. Now, a very large fraction of the history of uh, elliptic regularity theory is contained on this next slide. 
So what happened is that in the 80s, uh, Luis Caffarelli discovered an amazing mechanism, which is a very, very sophisticated version of the Harnack principle. And it's really exactly this, this business that there's a, there's a vestige of, the, of, the, of this crucial estimate that if you have the derivative being positive, then the function is essentially uh, 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 the um, level sets are well ordered. So what, what, what he said is that if the level sets are, I mean, I'm not going to explain what this means because it's very technical and it's, it's very crucial to the, what's going on, but it's, but it's very, very technical. If they're nearly graphs, the level sets are nearly graphs, but you don't have to have this in all of space, you just need it in some unit box. Then, in fact, the level sets still talk to each other. They still tell each other what to do. It's, it's, it's like at your Thanksgiving dinner when you have some disputes with your relatives and they tell each other what to do. Except that in this case, what happens is that person A argues with person B and each time they have an argument, the other person kind of softens up a little bit. And each time they have an argument, they, they tell the other person what to do and eventually they start cooperating and they coincide, and that is the regularity. They smooth, they smooth each other's rough corners out. And that mechanism is the proof of smoothness, all right, in, in metaphor. Now, there's an incredibly important caveat, however, and the caveat is that I had to assume that the level sets were nearly graphs to begin with. And that means they're sort of within epsilon of being graphs. They can spiral around, they can do everything, but they have to be trapped between two graphs, these level sets. Now, how in the world do you get that? Well, the answer is it's not always true. But it's almost always true. It's true almost everywhere for most boxes. And it, for the case of so-called one-phase free boundary problems, this was proved by Alton Caffarelli, and, and for two-phase, the, 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 what's considered to be the general case of this very, very natural thing. It's, it's proved by Alp Caffarelli and Friedman in a, in a landmark paper, which is very important, and it's how I got into this subject, is appreciating these, these papers. Now, the thing that we're aiming at today is the following. What these theorems, the second part of this type of theorem is silent about is which tilt you, you want to use whether the thing is a graph in this direction or it's a graph in that direction. Conceivably, it could spiral around for a while and then when you get to a sufficiently small scale, it stabilizes to being a graph. Or it could be one of the bad points where things go completely wrong, it's a singular set. So we really, and, and the, 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 the aesthetic of this is brilliant because in fact, because it's just absolutely false in general, you, you, you have to have a light touch. You don't want to have a conclusion which is, which is false. Uh, and so, that's, so this is why this is such a, anyway, this is the whole theory of regularity and it's from the 1980s. All right, so, so what are we going to do? So now, now that I've given my little prologue, or I think I called it a prologue, I'll tell you what the, what the uh, lectures are going to be about. So the first lecture, I'm gonna talk about level sets of eigenfunctions. All right, so I put a, I put a non-zero thing on the right-hand side. Actually, in the second talk, I'm going to make it even easier. I'm going to put a zero on the right-hand side. Okay, it turns out that things are complicated enough in that situation, as, as you'll see. So in the first talk, I'll just basically ask a bunch of questions about what the, sh what the behavior, what the shapes of the level sets are. And I will indicate my proposal for a way we might solve this problem. I, warn you that I don't have any answers here. This is, uh, you know, my exploration, but is, I hope you'll still find it interesting. I think it is interesting. Um, in the second talk, I'll tell you that, that this requires you to know uh, lots of things about differential geometry. So we'll have to do a little crash course in differential geometry, and uh, I'll tell you a lot of stuff about that, and uh, introduce these, these solitons. We, we, I don't think we'll get to the introduction of the solitons today, 
We'll probably do it at the beginning of next time. Or I may say a few words about it at the end. Okay? And then we're going to go back to the Harnack inequalities and, and maybe state some theorems which will give you a better feeling for what types of things we call Harnack inequalities, what they are. So the main thing that they, what, they, what a Harnack inequality says to you is the following. If you know something about a solution over here, it tells you something about a solution over there. It's, it's a way of, that the, that the um, different, part, different points in space talk to each other. It's like causality in uh, hyperbolic equations. It's the version of causality that works for elliptic equations. All right, and oh, I, I guess there's some words on the board which I haven't explained, free boundaries. It turns out that when you take this function f, if it, if it approximates a delta function, then you get what's called the free boundary theory. The advantage that the free boundary theory has is that it's scale invariant. And so you, there's a tremendous amount of informa extra information you get out of that, and this is a very, very natural scale invariant problem. It's probably the most natural one. It's the, 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 the simplest problem where you have an energy functional and there's some kind of phase transition involved. Um, and in the first case with free boundaries, there's some bulk energy remaining in the, in the other parts of space. With minimal surfaces, it's actually a more a specialization in which there's no energy in the, in, the, in the ambient space. In fact, the functions are actually just constant uh, in the complement of the surface. And then, and then there's some kind of jump that's going on. And that, that jump is, is uh, dictated by this. These delta functions are highly nonlinear. This is not a delta function of x. It's a delta function of u. So this requires some considerable uh, uh, analysis to interpret. Anyway, it's just the limiting case of the right-hand side being f. OK, so those are, those are the topics. And now we're going we're gonna to get started with some conjectures. So these are conjectures about, uh, well, eventually about eigenfunctions. But so first, I have to tell you the first very famous conjecture. So this is called the hot spots conjecture. It was made by Jeff Rausch in, in, in 1974. And it uh, is the following. Suppose you have a domain in Euclidean space. And suppose you have a solution to the heat equation. And it there's an insulated boundary. That is, the flux at the walls of this room are, are 0. OK, so I'm the person who's spouting the hot air. And then we stop. And there is no more heat produced by any of us, and so on. And we wait for what happens to this spot, this hot spot, which is right in front of my, my, my uh, mouth. And you wonder what, what it's going to do. And the answer is, it goes to the wall. OK? So the, the answer is that if you take the arg max of the function, it will tend to the boundary. And we'll explain what usually is in, in, in a minute. OK? All right, so here's the, what, so th this is really was just a metaphor. I mean, it, it, it is what he meant, but, but he really was thinking about Neumann eigenfunctions. Uh, so another way of saying it is the first non-trivial Neumann eigenfunction, which I'm going to call C1, achieves its maximum and minimum on the, on the boundary. So it's the, it's, it has to do with the behavior of the first non-trivial eigenfunction. So the family of eigenfunctions have correspond with these negative eigenvalues on the omega uh, on the side. And, and again, we're taking flux 0. The, no, the normal derivative is 0 on the boundary. And then there's always a trivial one, which is the constant, the, the, so the, the, sorry, the constant eigenfunction, which has 0 eigenvalue. And then the next one is always strictly positive and, and, and so forth. There can be multiplicity, but we're not going to worry about that so much today. And the statement, uh, the reason why this claim is more or less the same as what he meant is that what's really happening is if you take the expansion uh, of the heat equation in terms of the eigenfunctions, you'll get the eigenfunctions times the appropriate exponential in t. And then the main term is the constant. That's what it settles down to, right? In the, in the room, when I, when I have hot air, actually everything just goes to, goes to flat, the average of the temperature everywhere. But there is a, so that's kind of boring and doesn't tell you anything about max and min. But the next term is telling you where the maximum is going. It's getting attenuated, but it is going towards the wall if C1 is, is, has its maximum at the wall. 
right? So that, that's it. And if there's multiplicity, you just want all of the ones in that eigenspace to have this, this good property. Okay, so once again, the hotspots conjecture is really just a question about the behavior of the first non-trivial Neumann eigenfunction. And it's false. Okay, so the, the, the conjecture is wrong. Um, uh, uh, Chris Birdsey and, and uh, Birdsey and Werner proved it in 1999, and Chris Birdsey got a, a slightly better uh, example in 2005. There is a planar domain with holes, and in fact, the, the second example is with just one hole for which the, that first Neumann eigenfunction achieves its maximum in the interior. Tough luck. So, you know, it's still open for simply connected domains, but anyway. So Jeff Rausch, it's very, very funny. Every time I talk to him, he says, he's, he, was dis he tells me he's disappointed that, that, the theorem, that the conjecture was false. So he's just totally wrong, okay? This, in, this conjecture is way more interesting than he could ever have, have thought. And we, we, we don't understand it at all yet, but when we do, it's gonna be fantastic, is my opinion, all right? So, so this, is, this is a good conjecture. I think it's, it's really beautiful. So what's the kind of, uh, so the, the point is you have to figure out what it is that's really going on, what it is that's really controlling the shape of the eigenfunctions, what's controlling where the critical points are, where the, where the, where the level sets go. All right, so here's a, a conjecture which still has a chance of being true. It's one that I believe. Um, if the domain, now all, no, of course, you know, we, we only know some things about the plane. We know hardly anything about higher dimensions, but I'm still going to make the conjecture in higher dimensions. So you have, an, you have an open convex set, and C is the first non-trivial Neumann eigenfunction. Actually, any non-trivial Neumann eigenfunction, making it a little bit more specific, there can be a whole eigenspace of these guys. Um, then it has no interior critical points, all right? That obviously means the maximum is on the boundary, okay? So that's the first conjecture. And our brilliant progress up to this point is that it's true for triangles, okay? Sorry, <laughs> not much progress. Um, so there's been a lot of work on it though. Uh, Banuelos and Birdsey proved it in 1999 for obtuse triangles. And there's been work by various people, including an entire polymath project, which thought, God, for triangles, it has to be easy. You should be able to just be able to do it numerically. It turns out you can't tell the difference between the maximum being really close to the boundary and being actually on the boundary. So this is simply not tractable, as far as anybody can tell, as a numerical problem, even though it looks like a completely easy, tractable, compact problem, right? It's, and also, it's totally explicit. It's just triangles, right? Eventually, but using some of the techniques and comments in these intermediate stuff, Judge and Mondal proved it in 2020. And uh, they found a mistake, which they corrected in 22. So there's, a, there's an erratum, but it's... But it's now a theorem, that it works for acute triangles as well as obtuse triangles. I'm going to draw a picture just to uh, illustrate this. So here's the picture of an acute triangle. And here's the max. OK. And here's some level sets. And part of the reason why it's so tricky is that there are two local mins, and there's a saddle here, all right? So there are actually four critical points, typically, for an acute triangle on the, uh, on, the, on the boundary. And that's part of the reason why this is fairly complicated. So the level sets are pretty complicated. And that was part of why this was very hard. So I don't like complicated problems. I like simple problems. Remember, I said that we should think deeply of simple things. Well, this is not simple. And so we are going to think about simpler things. OK, so here's conjecture two, which I, which I also believe, and which is um, OK. So what does it say? It says that in a 
first of all, in, in words, in a convex domain with central symmetry, the first non-trivial eigenfunction is essentially one-dimensional. So let's do the one-dimensional case. In the one-dimensional case, you take the, the sine function on the interval minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, and you get it certainly achieves its minimum on the left and its maximum on the right. It's true, right? The theorem is true. All right. Now, the, the idea, so, you know, we think of in, 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 in personal life when a person is one-dimensional, a person is boring. That's exactly what I'm saying about these eigenfunctions. Even in higher dimensions, they are boring. All they do is they don't have any of this horrible stuff, this complexity here. They just go from the minimum to the maximum, and they're all, all the level sets are contractible. There's no topology. All right? So that's the claim. And the picture, if you like, is you have this shape, which is like an almond. And maybe, maybe, maybe well, this isn't quite what would happen, but I'll just do it anyway this way. So it goes like this. All right, these, these level sets meet at right angles with the, so here, if you like, is the min, and here's the max. Okay, really, really, they would be at the far ends, but I'm just drawing it this way. Okay, so uh, in, that, in, that, in that picture, because I have this central symmetry, this is x bar, and this thing is minus x bar, and the, and the eigenfunction is always going to be odd, all right? So there'll, there, there'll be, a, uh, the, the eigenfunctions are always odd. Sometimes there's multiplicity, so the, the max and min can, can go around. Like if you think of, a, of a, an equilateral polygon, it will have a, it'll have a multiplicity two uh, eigen, eigenfunction. So what happens in the if you just smooth a little bit the corners? If you smooth a little bit the corners, it looks, the, there's no change in the, in the configuration. There's a little bit of problem if you have an equilateral triangle, the multiplicity is two. So you, you should think about, um, you know, so it's not, I mean, it's, but anyway, there is a, there is a nearby one which is stable, which, which is just that. And if you smooth out the corners, it looks exactly the same. Okay, so now, so this is, this is the claim that I'm making, is that the directional derivative here, it's monotone in the, in the, in the vector from the min to the max. It's monotone in that direction. So, you know, obviously, it has to be in the direction of this. So this is completely wrong. It would have to be in the direction of this. Of this uh, yeah, OK. I'm drawing it totally wrong. But in any case, that's, it has to be that way. All right? Yeah, that's, that just shows I'm not drawing this uh, in, a, in a consistent way. All right, so uh, there is a theorem in this direction. In, in 2000, um, Nikolai Nadir-Shvili and I proved that it's true for planar domains with two axes of symmetry. If you have uh, reflection in two directions, the eigenfunction can go all the way around. So that includes these equilateral polygons. Um, but, uh, and, the, and the method is the method that I really have in mind for these entire lectures. So the, the method is called the method of continuity. It's the equivalent in continuum mathematics of the method of induction, of mathematical induction. You have something which is true, and then you have a way of going forward and going forward and going forward. All right? That's, that's, the math, that's mathematical induction. When you do it continuously, you have to show that the set on the interval 0, 1 of, of a family of domains for which something is true is both open and closed. It's a little different because Instead of being discrete, you have to do, you have to get forward when you when you're stopped by a closed interval, and when you're stopped by an open interval, you have to close it up. So the closing up you just maybe do by taking a limit, and the opening up you do by having a neighborhood. And to get the neighborhood from a closed interval, you need a quantitative estimate, or you need something to go wrong. And 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 what the method that we used is we studied the directional derivatives. And we studied the first time that a directional derivative goes, goes wrong. We did it for all possible directions. And that actually also is the method that's used for the, uh, is, is related to the method that's used by Judge and Mondal. So that's, that's the one that seems to be working. Now, what I want to do is do this in a, we were only able to do this in a very qualitative way. 
and I want to be able to do it in a quantitative way. And that would mean showing that somehow, if this thing is non-negative, it's maybe strictly positive in some sense. Now, that can never work near this point because things are getting steeper and steeper and they're going into a critical point. So this is just wrong, and so you have to, there has to be an appropriate replacement. And that's, the, that's what, what I'm searching for. Okay, so I've tried to give you an, a, a feel for what the questions are like, and we're going to just be talking about... Uh, so there's one other theorem in this subject. Um, so here's another theorem. Attar and Birdsey in 2005, so if you, you, you take a function uh, on a domain that looks a little bit like, uh, uh, you know, the mouth of a pumpkin, all right? All right? So, so it turns out that if the slope of the top and the bottom is less than or equal to 1, then the thing is monotone in this direction. Oh dear, we're getting some uh, feedback here. All right, I don't know why. Okay, so, so it's, it's monotone. So here's the min and here's the max. And that's, the, um, that's what the theorem says. It's, it's written in, in great detail here. So I'm saying that the top and the bottom are, are graphs and they're, uh, and they're of slope 1. And we're just saying that we start at the same place at the bottom on the left and the right. And then the horizontal derivative is strictly positive. Now this, even though they proved it using some probabilistic, some coupled Brownian motion uh, with, with two particles, what this really is, is this is a kind of a Harnack inequality. And what it is, is that you're taking, it's kind of a two-point Harnack inequality where you're taking ex this expression here the dot product of the, direction, of the gradient in two directions. And on the boundary, no matter what, it has to be pointing in the directions of the boundary. And because they only separate by 45 degrees in each direction, the dot product is, at most, is always non-negative because it's 90 degrees. And so what's happening is that these are always, this is always non-negative. And so the quantitative version of it would be strictly positive. So heuristically, what this is saying is that um, that, that monotonicity persists, this sort of double monotonicity. All right. So now I'm going to move on to other shapes of eigenfunctions. So, you know, the eigenfunctions do this. God only knows exactly. They're, 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 they're doing this, but I'm not really, you know, I'm not going to try too hard to draw them at this point. The point is that they're graphs here. Okay, so now, now we're going on to what the shapes of eigenfunctions look like for the Dirichlet problem, which is possibly simpler. We'll, 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 we'll see. And I, uh, the first thing to observe for uh, Dirichlet eigenfunctions is that we already know something very uh, uh, nice about the shapes when we start with a convex domain. Namely, that all of the uh, domains inside are convex. So I'm going to draw another picture here of a convex domain, suggestively a triangle. I don't know. doesn't matter. And if you take the level sets, they're all going to be convex inside. And so, of course, they just go towards some kind of some max somewhere, and they, they, they converge in, in, in in 2D. They're just going to be ellipses, essentially, coming in to the max. All right? But in general, they're a little bit like ellipses, because every convex domain is comparable to an ellipse. Uh, so the, the, the theorem of Brass, Camp, and Leap says that all of the level sets are convex. And then, so I called them omega t. Well, these are the super level sets. They're the, the, the set where the function is bigger than tau rather than equal to tau. And then every such set is trapped between two comparable ellipsoids, elli ellipsoids in, higher, in n dimensions, ellipses. Okay? And then you can ask the question, so it's reasonable to ask the question, what's the, what's the eccentricity of those ellipses in general for, for a convex domain. 
And the answer is, um, well, so I, I proved in, 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 uh, in two dimensions. I, I proved in the, in the 1990s that if you do the triangle, and in fact this works for arbitrary convex domains uh, with some uh, proportion, this turns out to be a size n to the one third. Uh, one third. Sorry. n to the one third. All right. That's really easier than it seems because if you think of a, of a circular sector, this is a Bessel function and it's the transition region for the asymptotics of Bessel functions. But in general, it's a, it's a universal theorem for all convex planar domains that there's a shape here, okay? Now, so what, what should the general conjecture be? So here, here's what I, what I consider to be the general conjecture. So in order to understand the general conjecture, I just have to write down what the solution is for a rectangle. Okay, so the, for a rectangle, the rectangle has these, uh, you know, in general has, has uh, these dimensions. The eigenfunction is completely explicit. It's just the product of the signs. And notice that the Hessian is just equal to a constant multiple of the, of the function itself. As you know, you know this equa differential equation for the sine function, which you try to make your students who do ODEs dream of constantly and wake up remembering every single time they do a problem. Okay, so that's true. Now here's what I claim is, is, should be true in general. Now, this is true in two dimensions by, by a theorem that I proved, but I have no idea how to do it in higher dimensions. Um, so I claim that the Hessian stabilizes, namely, well, certainly, uh, this actually is an exponential tail down here, but in this region here, this is where C is, the, the eigenfunction is bigger than a half of its maximum. And in that central region, it should stabilize just like the rectangle, and all of the ellipses should be similar, all right? And so what this is saying, is, this is a little slightly stronger statement, is saying that that the value of, at, the, at the maximum, at the center point, that, that uh, uh, quadratic, um, its whole Hessian is a, as, a, as a symmetric matrix. I've got a minus sign here because it's negative. So this is a positive definite matrix. Uh, traps all of the matrices all the way down in this entire uh, middle region. So the, 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 the thing just, just stabilizes, all right? There are more detailed conjectures that one can make, but it doesn't matter. This is, this is good enough, all right? So I've already, so, so here's, here are my candidates. I've told you the shape here. I'm not very confident that I understand this because uh, it's a little special. It definitely fails uh, beyond the slope one thing. But here I'm saying something that I want to be true universally for convex domains and here universally for convex domains with this, with this symmetry here, all right? And, and here I'm not quite ready but I'm, but I'm saying that, well, I did tell you that I, I want the, the um, critical points to be on the boundary. Unfortunately, there could be a lot of them. All right. So those are the conjectures. And now we get to the hope for, for an approach to uh, resolving these conjectures. So uh, I'm going to describe to you a, variation, a new variational principle which uh, occurred to me uh, based on uh, a comment that uh, Boaz Clartog made in, in 2019, which is that if you look at the nodal set, so the, the, the zero set of, this, of this eigen, these eigenfunctions, then it's stationary with respect to flux. Uh, analogous to the way minimal surfaces are stationary with respect to area. So they, the variation is zero. Okay? So he made this remark in the middle of a talk. I'm just so thankful that he did this, uh, uh, which was about another subject, but somehow he, he, he came out with this. He said, by the way, and, and I just said, oh my God, well, what about all the other levels? because of course I was thinking about this, had been thinking about this for years. And so 
I thought, well, maybe it's like mean curvature flow. And in fact, if you just check his calculations, it's completely correct. So what's going on here is that if you, so now if you take level, so now I'm calling it level set flow. If you, if you move from one level set to another, what does a particle do? It has to go a certain distance to get to the next level set. And the answer, it always has to go the reciprocal, the rate at which it goes is one over the gradient of the function because that's how fast you should go in order to land on the next one. All right? So that's what you would call level set flow, period, no matter what function it is. And the claim is that it decreases flux, which is the gradient, the, the, this weighted version of surface area, fastest. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you exactly what that means uh, in, a, in, in a second. But let me just emphasize what the analogy now is. The, the analogy is that if you do mean curvature flow, which means that you, mo you, you move by the factor which is called mean curvature h times the normal, then we know that that decreases area fastest. So there ought to be an analogy between the reciprocal of the gradient and the mean curvature. Now, there is a huge literature on mean curvature flow. And uh, there's tremendous tools from differential geometry to, uh, uh, to use on them. And so on the next slide, I'm going to just mention to you, oops. Boy, I, I, I just decided that this clicker would actually work, but it doesn't. OK. Uh, so here are my high hopes for the analogy with mean curvature flow. And Ricci flow is, is, is what everybody has in the back of their head when they think of mean curvature flow is like a prep for Ricci flow, which is a little fancier and uses a little more differential geometry. So first of all, the, the level sets I claim uh, now we can see resemble shrinkers. So let me show you the shrinkers here. So this is nothing but a shrinker. It starts at, at 0, and then it shrinks to this point. Okay? In mean curvature flow, what happens is you start with a convex domain, you shrink to a sphere, and then that contracts to a point. So here, there are ellipses and ellipsoids. Okay? Over here, I'm going to skip this one. I'm not going to ignore that one. Um, over here, it's the same thing, but it's two shrinkers. So this is two shrinkers. All right, there's one, this is the zero set, and it goes this way or the other way. And that's because of the, the directional, you know, the, the direction of the, of the sign dictates the direction that we're going. All right, so there, there are two of them here. Here, there, 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 are, there are three shrinkers, okay? All right, they, they, they go to these places, and we have this weird thing. This is, this is what uh, uh, is, is, is called in, in, um, in Ricci flow, this is a neck. This is the topological uh, uh, shift uh, that, that, that happens. So what, what happens here is that the kinds of questions that we're asking actually already have analogs in differential geometry and the PDE of mean curvature flow and Ricci flow. Namely, Hamilton proved some Harnack inequalities which say that the values of h at different points in space-time are comparable. And that's exactly what we want. We want to prevent this from vanishing, so this method of continuity, this is the quantitative control that we need. All right? We hope. His, he has something which is called curvature pinching, which is what proves that the, that the, the, the uh, flow goes to a sphere. The, the uh, curvatures, the principal curvatures, get closer and closer to being the same, and the, and the spheres get closer and closer. So here we have, they're getting similar to each other, but it's ellipsoids. But they're getting closer and closer. And, and, and by the way, we said that, the, that these things talk to each other. Here, they were incredibly rigid. They just told each other exactly what to do. Well, actually, when you get into here, it's totally wrong that these are graphs. But it is true that they're talking to each other. They're getting more and more rigid. They're getting more and more like the same thing here. So for sure, it's, it's, this is what we really should be aiming for. All right? So that's, those are called curvature pinching estimates. And then Perelman's estimates, which have to do with what happens with these necks, 
are, I hope, telling us something about this, this little neck here, this, this shift in the topology. Okay? So that's, that's the hope. Now, so let, let me uh, uh, disappoint you slightly. So first of all, I haven't been able to make this work yet, all right? I have a tremendous amount of arithmetic and formulas, which I will show you next time. But it's not, it's no, there are no theorems, all right? There's, there, it's still very, it's very, it's more suggestive, I think. You'll, you'll, you'll become persuaded that there's, there's something here, uh, I think. But, you know, it's not, there's nothing, there are no theorems. And, and the, the other thing is that um, it's also actually wrong. So I, I, I should warn you about this. Uh, so the Ricci flow and uh, mean curvature flow are governed by a parabolic equation. And what we have here is an elliptic equation. And you can't really get away from that. You're not going to be able to use parabolic maximum principles, which is what these people use. You'll, you'll, you'll use elliptic maximum principles. And the, the, the thing that you should have in mind is that it's, it, it, it's sort of like, you know, it's like a geodesic or, or a clothesline that's going between two places. This, this is not sort of the, the end result as time goes to infinity. This is, just, this is just one of the poles on which the, the, uh, the in-between uh, surfaces are strung. It's, it's that you have an optimization problem like a geodesic between this shape and the, and the, and the, and the, and the one in there, all right? So it's, it's, a lot of the formulas are going to be, look completely different in the end in that, in that respect. So it's not, it's not completely parallel. All right, so uh, I don't know uh, what my, my, my rules are. I, I have one, so I, I, I have two choices. I can, I can stop right here, or I can just tell you the proof of this, um, uh, the fact that the, the, uh, that the flow decreases uh, flux fastest. That's, that's my proof for the... What, what do you, what, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm fine, or we can just take questions now, and I'll just do this next time. It's up to me? No. I mean, somebody has to have a, they have to have a sense of whether you, do you want to see the proof now? I, I, I got actually some head nods. That's pretty good. You know, sometimes in classes, you don't actually get people to say something. But okay, we're going to do it. Okay, so the first part of the proof is the following. First, I have to explain to you what it means for mean curvature flow to decrease area fastest, okay? So what it means is the following. First, you have to calculate the first variational formula, that is the rate of change of surface area when you move by a normal variation. So you have a surface, and you're going in by some uneven amount, you know, some, some things longer, some things shorter, all right? And you figure out this other surface, and so that's this formula here. You move the surface by n times t times a, a fixed v, which is a velocity. All right? And then you differentiate with respect to t, and you evaluate at t equals 0. And what's well known about mean curvature is that um, the, the rate of, sorry, the, of surface area is that its first variation is mean curvature. So if you're, if you're pointing inwards, it's going to shrink area. That's why there's a minus sign there. That's the minus sign, and proportional to the, to the, to the mean curvature. So that's, that's a, a well-known fact. That's the first variation of surface area. And then you have to do the following arithmetic. You want to do this as fast as possible. That is, you want to make this, this number as huge negative as possible. But you have to do it with a constraint. Otherwise, it's meaningless. You could go very fast, and you would it doesn't. So this constraint is the square. It's this sort of, uh, you know, natural quadratic constraint with respect to surface measure. All right? And when you do that optimization problem, trivially, you will see that it's just a multiple of h that's the right thing, because the way the optimization works is that these two expressions have, are, are the same up to constants. So, so v is h, so that's an h squared here, and there's an h squared there, and that's why it's the, I mean, that's not a proof, but this is a well-known calculation. So we do exactly the same thing for um, flux with, with this other thing. So with, with flux, and now it's completely general. It works with the right-hand side being f, 
It had nothing to do with its being an eigenfunction or anything. It's just a completely general fact. If you take this flow, it's going to decrease the flux fastest. And for that, you have to calculate the first variation, which turns out to have this unbelievably simple formula here. It's literally that you drop this gradient term, and you get this. And then there's a factor which is exactly the right-hand side. Right? So this is the calculation. I'll do this calculation on the next slide. But the, then the idea is simply that if you take this thing, which you want to want to maximize, subject to this constraint with this weight, which is now the weight that we're using, you will get exactly the reciprocal of the gradient. So it's the it's the same calculation. And let me just tell you the identity that is involved. So when you take this rate of change, half of it is the change of the surface area, and the other half is what happens when the, you take the normal derivative of the gradient, that's, that's all that's going on. But when you take the normal derivative gradient, you get the Laplacian, which is, which is exactly this. And that's, that's this identity here that, that gives the, uh, that, that gives the, um, gives it. Okay, so um, we'll, we'll stop here. And next time I'll explain to you about solid time, what, what, what this is, how this is parallel. They, now a, a real approach to studying these level surfaces. This is in the plane. Oh, so the, the, only, the theorems are all in the plane. This statement, of course, is true in all, all right. dimensions. This is, all in the plane. this is The only theorems are in the plane. And, what about and I'm claiming that it's true in all dimensions. And I'm claiming that also there's an interesting question as the dimension tends to infinity. Yeah, but that's in three dimensions. In three dimensions. And in results there? Or? Well, there's one result of. Um, Oh my God, um, Cavol, Bernard Cavol, um, that a, that a, a, for a cylinder. So if you take something which is completely flat, and then it's a product product uh, domain, then indeed the the minimum is here and the maximum is there. Two and a half dimensions, yes. <laughs> okay. Second question is what happens if you take instead of Dirichlet and Neumann, you take the third the mixed boundary. Yeah, I think that that's, that's very tricky. Mixed boundary conditions are very tricky. Um, I, let me give you one more example. I, I, might, I might talk something about this. So if you, if you take um, a, a Gaussian weight, okay, then the, then the eigenfunctions are the linear functions. And, and, the, and, the, and the level sets are planes. So that's, that's another example of this. That's, that's the, the, uh, the, the weight being e to the minus x squared in, instead of, anyway, so that's, that's an n-dimensional statement. So there's special examples. Well, this was the first Neumann eigenfunction. It's mean value zero. Yeah, but for domains like this, yeah. if the third boundary problem is not, is not being considered. The third boundary problem, so, so okay, let, let me just sort of back up. The geometry that I'm going to describe is a local geometry. In other words, it's really only going to be talking about the, uh, the um, Taylor expansion here. But it will also care about the Taylor expansion here, and then the boundary condition would enter. But it's relevant even to mixed boundary value problems. But then the, que the question of whether this is true or not is a, is a, is a global question. So in other words, this, this part has to talk to this part, which also has to talk to this part. So you know, if you have different boundary conditions, then there will be different conclusions. And s there may not be s very coherent ones if, if you, uh, I, I would be very hesitant to make a conjecture for mixed boundary conditions. That's all right. You, maybe next time people will be even more confused. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you again for the talk.